Thank you for uh, braving uh, the traffic in Rehoboth to be here. So, uh, if you are a visitor today, we would love to welcome you and just to help you better understand who we are. So, are there any visitors to the house on this day? Uh, down here, okay. We'll soon, quickly soon. Somebody get an usher there. Somebody get. <laughs> We're coming. Okay. All right, Mel, down here. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Great to have you here. <clears throat> we hope this time encourages both uh, your spirit and your life. So, a couple of announcements and we'll be on our way. Uh, one is we're continuing in the routine of the summer for LCOS. And among those things in that routine, uh, one is the International Student Dinners on Wednesday evenings. And if you want to be part of that holy chaos, um, you can come in around 4.30 or so, and uh, we will put you to work. Um, and uh, it's just a, a great outreach to the few students who are here this year. But still, uh, we, don't, we don't get caught up in numbers. We're privileged to serve and to help, them, help incarnate Christ's love for them. Um, the second thing is that there is a theater camp going on most of the weekdays for several weeks during the summer, and they kind of use the uh, fellowship hall. So if you are in the building between 9 and 3, Monday through Friday, we would just ask that you, if possible, don't go in there. <laughs> Stay out of there. Uh, just let them have that space and, uh, and so forth. Uh, we are planning to do a vacation Bible school, the first one we've done for young people uh, since before COVID. Uh, so if you are interested in being part of that, second week of July, sign up sheet right outside the back door, uh, 9 to 12, Monday through Friday, and uh, we hope to be able again to share Christ's love with a whole bunch of, uh, whole bunch of little people. So, Also the blessing box, that's our little box on the corner out there. Um, it is used a lot, which is what we intended. And so if you look in the newsletter, it will give you a hint as to what things you might bring in to help keep that little box supplied. Uh, there are a good number of people in our community who recognize the gift that that is, and they are appreciative of it. Uh, it's just one way in which we can incarnate the love we talk about in here to the world out there. Finally, uh, right after the service in the yellow room, that's what I call it, classrooms one and two, uh, there'll be, uh, we hope, a brief meeting on the call process. This is specifically aimed for members of the working of the Congregational Profile Working Group, but also the members who have just been asked to serve on a call committee. So this is a sharing of information, just this is where we are, this is what we need to do. Uh, if you want to sit in on that meeting, you're certainly welcome to do so. Uh, we try to do transparency here. There's no secrets, no smoke-filled rooms. Uh, it's just uh, a bunch of folks trying, trying to discern what God's will is. So if you want to be part of that, come join us after, right after the this, this service is over. I think that's enough. Then if we listen to some beautiful music uh, played by Melvin and uh, accompanied by Jerry.
I said in the early service, it never sounded like that when I played the recorder. <laughs> so I'm grateful for somebody who knows how to play and plays it well as you do. Thanks for sharing with you. If you are able, I invite you to rise as we begin our praise of a very gracious God. As always, we make our strong beginning in the name of God the Father, and of God the Son, and of God the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we join together in the opening prayer. Faithful God, most merciful judge, you care for your children with firmness and compassion. By your spirit, nurture us, live in your kingdom, that we may be rooted in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please remain standing for the singing of the opening song.
and sisters, in life we face difficult choices. Let us pause to reflect on how we have often wrongly responded and how God in his mercy has been faithful to his promises. Let us take a moment of silence to reflect on how we have lived our lives in these last several days. Heavenly Father, we confess that when we find ourselves facing hard situations, we often choose what's easiest and most comfortable for us, rather than seeking your way. We confess that most often we seek our own glory rather than your glory. We are selfish and tend to do our things for ourselves rather than sharing with those in need. Lord, forgive our doubt and fear, and help us to do the hard things in life according to your will. Amen. Our loving Heavenly Father has heard our cry for mercy and sent his Son Jesus to be our Savior. He suffered and he died for you and for me so that we might be restored in our relationship with God. So be at peace, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May be seated for the reading of the lessons. The lessons assigned to be read on this, the eighth Sunday in the ordinary time and season of the church, begin with a lesson from the Old Testament from the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah is writing to these words to what's left of the nation of Israel, namely the one tribe of Judah. They're at the tail end of their 50-year exile in Babylon. And during that 50 years, they've been surrounded by all of the ziggurats, which were the temples built to Babylonian gods and goddesses, really bizarre things. It's important to remember Israel was the only nation in the ancient world that was monotheistic. The only one believed in one God. All the rest believed in a panoply of gods and goddesses, and all of whom were doing a lot of crazy things up there that affected us down here. So Isaiah goes to great pains to remind the people of Israel that before they leave Babylon, remember, remember the God you worship. This is one God. One God who called you, one God who loves you, one God who will be with you. These are important words for us to remember as well. Isaiah 44, beginning at verse 6. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let them foretell what will come. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. The New Testament reading is from the pen of St. Paul as he writes to the little house church in Rome. There's a lot of words in here because, well, Paul is a good one with words and the letter to the Romans has got a lot of words in it. But he's trying very hard through rabbinic logic and, and debate, if you will, to help the people in that little house church to realize the new thing that has come upon them which is learning to live with justification by faith. And it's not what you do that connects you with God. It's what God has already done for you in Christ that makes the difference. In the discipline of lifestyle, the first half of the lesson, he contrasts what it means to keep living as a slave to sin, in other words, keep doing the same old stuff over and over again, or living as a beloved and redeemed child of God, freed from the burden of that sin, because of Christ Jesus. 
The second half of the lesson focuses on the fact that even if you're a beloved child of God, life will be difficult. He doesn't pretend that life was simple or easy. It wasn't in the first century, it isn't today. But he goes on to use the word hope, and as you listen to it read, count how many times he uses the word hope, and what that hope is based on, which is what we hold on to, that God's love for us isn't going anywhere. These are good words to remember. This is Romans 8, beginning at verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise if you are able as we listen to the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel on this morning is given to us from the witness of St. Matthew, the 13th chapter, beginning at the 24th verse. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, the farmer replied. The servants asked him, well then do you want us to go and pull them up? No, the farmer answered. Because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, but then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. Jesus answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. And as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
But then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. We join our hearts and our voices together in affirming our faith in this Christ. I believe, I believe in one God, united on high, ruler of the heavens and the earth, full of grace and mercy. I believe in the Father who has created me and all that exists. I believe in the Son who has redeemed me by his death and resurrection. I am not baptism into his name. I am saved from sin, death, and the power of the devil. King of God and man, my Lord Jesus Christ is now seated at the right hand of the Father. I believe in the Holy Spirit daily sanctifies me, he blesses me and guides me as I live in my life in the body of Christ, the one true holy apostolic church. On the last day, we will gather me and all believers, even raising them from the dead, into heaven, where I will live in holiness and blessedness forever. Amen. Please be seated. God's grace, God's mercy, and God's kindness rest deep, deep in your hearts, deep in your minds, this day and always, because of Jesus Christ, our Lord. The text is a gospel lesson read a few moments ago, so far, the text. The son of Rabbi Harold Kushner was diagnosed with an incurable illness and died at a young age. In response, the rabbi wrote a book in 1981 entitled, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. It became an instant bestseller and it still is available on Amazon, I checked this morning, along with a companion book that he wrote a few years after that. I think the enduring popularity of that book is simply because it asks the very question that every human being who has ever graced this planet will ask at some point in their earthly journey. Why are there bad things? And what do we do with that? Jesus kind of gives us a little bit of an answer using yet another parable about farming. He sets up the seed with a farmer who, with good intentions, spreads wheat seeds in his field, expecting and hoping for a good harvest. But then the cover of darkness, an enemy comes along and spreads weed seeds in the same field. And if you're curious, the specific seed that he planted was Zazinia. This is a Greek word meaning bearded darnel, a weed that was common to the Middle East and Maybe it's common even here, I don't know. It's a pesky weed because it doesn't give up and it kind of masks as being a good thing as it grows. And so as the wheat seeds sprout and the weed seeds sprout, they grow up next to each other and everything looks to be fine for a moment. And then finally, as the wheat seeds begin to form heads, the farmhands realize there's a weed problem. Immediately they go to the farmer saying, we got a weed problem, boss. What do you want us to do with it? How about if we go in there and rip those suckers up right now? And the farmer's answer surprises them. The farmer says, no. Let it be as it is for right now. Wait. Wait until the end when finally we pull everything up and by that point we'll see exactly what is truly wheat and what is truly wheat, and we will burn the weeds and we will gather the wheat. The farmhands wisely take the farmer's advice. 
It's all about the principle of patiently waiting, and I think that's still applicable even for us. We open our eyes to the gift of each day, we look around the world, and we see that there is lots of good things going on. Lots of people, if given opportunity, will rise to the challenge of compassion and generosity, sometimes surprising themselves and sometimes surprising us. If our eyes are open to seeing it, there's goodness going on around us all the time. But we look at the same world and we also recognize there's lots of bad things going on. A lot of weeds out there among the wheat. A lot of bad things happening to very good people. And so like the farm ants in the text, we want to rip those things right out of the ground. We want to make it all turn out right. We want to make it the way it's supposed to be so that only the good seed survives. How interesting then that we were asked to take the farmer's advice. Marcia and I like to work in the garden of our house. I'm the guy who likes to plant stuff. And especially new stuff, I love to see what will this look like when it comes up. My wife, on the other hand, is the weeder. <laughs> and I need to buy her a shirt that says, weeds tremble when they hear my name. <laughs> because my wife weeds with intensity. I lay in bed at night praying to God that she doesn't see that I am a weed. <laughs> and even if you don't like gardening, I hope at least you can appreciate the kind of zeal that she has. Because all of us like to bring order out of chaos. There is something deeply instilled with us from the time we are born that wants designed to say good things happen to good people. Bad things and bad people need to be erased. We spend a lot of time and a lot of energy trying to make it all turn out fair. If you're in doubt of that, think about what you were as a preschooler the first time that you told the teacher what your, what your a classmate had just done. You were eager to make sure that the teacher knew there were bad stuff happening and you expected the teacher to respond. Even as adults, we do the same thing. We keep looking around going, that's bad stuff. Like those farmhands, we want to take it out. I think because there is within us an innate sense of justice, we just want to see it turn out fair. And here in the parable, we're taught to wait. It doesn't mean that we ignore bad things or we try to make believe they aren't happening. It does mean, however, that we are not the ones who decide finally what is good and what is bad. That God is aware of everything that's going on, good, bad, and ugly. And trusting that in God's way and time, God will take care of it. And that ultimately, God's good can overcome the worst of the bad that the world can throw at us. But living with that kind of patient mindset is not something that is easy for us to do. The headlines, social media, are rich with stories every day of bad things happening to good people. Whether it's in Ethiopia, or Palestine, or Sudan, or Ukraine, or your next door neighbor. There was a time when we could claim to be blissfully ignorant of it. But thanks to the technology that is both a burden and a blessing, we can't be naive anymore. We know instantaneously when bad things show up. We also, of course, every morning have to contend with the possibility there may be some bad happening in our lives. That there are probably going to be some weeds along the way, that not everything is going to turn out the way we want. In frustration, we kind of pray to God asking the same question over and over and over again. Three words, three letters, rather. Why? And oft time, the answer we get 
seems to be a divine silence. And we're left to try to figure this out on our own. I think, though, the parable Jesus tells helps remind us that life is an intricate dance of good and evil coexisting together. There's weeds and there's wheat everywhere. Things happen to us, things happen to other people that we cannot explain. Sometimes we are surprisingly blessed, and other times we feel like we're being painfully punished. It is through both, however, that we learn and that we grow. The journey of life is not about being fair. It never will come out even. In spite of our best intentions, our best effort to the contrary, it doesn't work that way. We will go to our graves with far more questions and answers. But faith asks us to trust, again, that God is aware, and that in the end, God's will prevails. What encourages us in that trust, I think, is realizing that sometimes there is more weed than wheat inside of our own heart. Our own words and actions, we not nearly as saintly as we like to believe we are, or as we like other people to think we are. The truth is, if we're honest, as we look in the mirror, that there's a lot of stuff inside of us masking in good that isn't good at all. Not for us not for anybody else. Coming to terms with that is important because God has every right to rip us up like a weed, throw us into the fire even today. But like the farmer in the parable, God is patient. God is willing to wait us out. God gives us a whole lifetime to confront what is weed and what is weak inside of our own heart. And even before the kind of harvesting and judgment that Jesus pictures here, punishment comes. If we were to die right now, having lived more like weed than wheat, having focused our time and energy on ourselves and on getting what we think we want, we need, we deserve, we are entitled to, we realize too late we wasted the time, we wasted the gifts, we die with an empty heart. If instead, if we were to die right now, if we have spent our time trying to be more like wheat, trying to rise up to be more productive, more living with compassion, generosity, humility, and grace, well then it is, I think, we leave this place with our hearts satisfied. It is the cross of Christ itself that gives us the courage to stop wasting time and energy discerning what is out there that's good and bad, wheat and wheat, and instead look in our own heart. And maybe instead of judging, maybe the task is to begin asking ourselves this question. When bad comes, what can I learn from it? How can I grow from this? How can I take what the world or the people or what life has presented to me as ugliness and transform it into something beautiful. Because the power of God's love for us in Christ gives us courage and compassion and grace enough to be able to transform the pestiest weed into the most beautiful wheat. Through him we can become, again, a sign of grace as God intended in a broken and hurting world where sometimes there's a lot of ugliness I saw a t-shirt the other day that said, I gotta let God take care of this bad because if I do it, I'm gonna go to jail. <laughs> well, that may be one motivation for your not jumping into the fray and trying to judge what's good and what's bad. But I think the better posture is learning as the farm hands did, to let it play out and to trust that in God's way and in God's time, beyond our imagining or understanding. God is at work. 
And the cross gives us the confidence to truly believe in the end the winners don't win. May that assurance be part of your life and of mine. Let the people of God say, Amen. <laughs> in this day, we were remembering lots of people in our own faith family, especially. We're praying for Scott Christ. This is the brother of Sue Elsroth, who is recovering from cancer surgery. We also pray for Evienna. This is the newborn grandchild of Peter and Julie Oswald. Evienna was um, taken to the hospital and then taken to a more significant uh, PICU hospital. Uh, she's less than a month old. Uh, is recovering from scald skin syndrome, uh, kind of a um, uh, very odd, and yet she is beginning to re beginning to respond to the antibiotics. So we pray for her, and of course for Peter and Julie. We also pray for Joan. This is the mother of Terry Shaheen. Uh, Joan went; she fell last week and broke her hip. Uh, she went through surgery yesterday and is recovering. 
uh, and uh, Carrie is really her primary caregiver. So we pray for Joan, we pray also for Terry. We're asked to pray for Lick Dirks. This is a good friend of Jean McCrory, uh, who is probably under hospice care. Uh, we pray also for his wife, Lorraine, who is Jean's best friend. Jean also asked that we pray for another Jean, Jean Foray, uh, who was walking into uh, a pizza place up the road here and fell and uh, suffered significant injuries. Uh, so we pray for her as she tries to recover. Pray also for Roger Stark, who is dealing with uh, stage four cancer. We also pray for those who are mourning, uh, for the family and friends of Sherry Garcia, friend of the Funks, but also friends and family of Doris de Philippus. Some of you may remember Doris. Uh, she was and her husband were members here for a good long time. Uh, Doris has been in New Jersey for several years and uh, died there. I think she was 95. For those marking anniversaries and birthdays, we pray for Barbara Schmidt, Ken Deagle, Joanne Leroy, George Kruer, John Thomas, Reiner Gruber, Shirley Flegel, and John and Liz Dean. So for these and others, I invite you to rise. <clears throat> God of grace and mercy, we step lively into a new day, not knowing what's out there. We scan the horizon, <clears throat> and we're trying to figure out what is weed and what is wheat, where are the good things, where are the bad things, what to prepare ourselves for, and how to respond. Give us the grace to trust and believe that in all of this, you are there, and that you are aware of this more than we are, and that in the end, your grace prevails. Help us, Lord, to have the courage and faithfulness to patiently wait and to know that your love is there. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for the church throughout the world, especially places where it is being persecuted. We pray that you would give to our brothers and sisters courage and resolve to bear witness to the truth of the gospel hope, so that others may also be drawn to your love and to your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for this faith family that your spirit may fall upon each member, reminding them and encouraging them to realize what their baptism calls them to do and to be. Be with us, Lord, as we seek again to be your people in the world in which we find ourselves, and help us indeed to be agents of reconciliation and grace wherever we go, through our words and through our actions. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for many people in our minds and on our hearts. We pray especially this day for Scott, Scott. for Aviana, for Joan, Joan. for Link. Link, for Jean. Jean. For Roger. Roger. We pray for these and those who love them, O oh God, that you might find them in whatever place they're in this morning, that you might lift them up where they need to be lifted, and encourage them where they need to be encouraged. We also, Lord, come into this room with other people on our minds and on our hearts, and so we are bold enough now to shout their names out loud, trusting that you hear, and that in your way and time you will answer. And so on this day, we also pray for In whatever place these loved ones are, O oh God, come near to them. May they be reassured of your love and of ours. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray, of God, for the world around us, especially when it seems like there's far more weed than wheat. We pray especially for places where the weed seems to be winning, where the world is at war. We pray for the people of Ukraine and Palestine and Syria and Sudan and Ethiopia and elsewhere. We pray that somehow your word of grace and hope might find its way behind the stubborn hearts and wills of people and bring healing. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for our own country. We pray it for all the people in it, for all the leaders of it whom we have elected to serve. We ask, O oh God, that you would bless them with a double measure of grace and understanding and compassion, that they might learn how to listen more than speak and work together more for the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. 
We pray, O oh God, for those who are marking milestones. We pray especially in this day for Barbara, Barbara. Ken, Ken. Joanne, Joanne. George. George, John, John. Reiner, Reiner. Shirley. Shirley, John and Liz. John and Liz. Give them grace and courage and, and humor and thanksgiving as they look back to what has been and as they try to look forward with, with, to what might be. Help them to know that in the journey, and your love for them is never far away. And may that sustain them and give them hope. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And be with us, God, as we come again to table to take you at your word, your promise, this holy mystery of bread and wine and body and blood. And through this again, Lord, may you touch us where we need to be touched. May you heal us where we need to be healed. May you encourage us where we need to be encouraged to know that your grace is there for us and that we are your beloved and your redeemed. Help us to leave this room stronger than when we came in and to live life in your name and for your purpose. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we join together as we say, Peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. I encourage you to share that peace enthusiastically with each other. On the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took a cup of the wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave that to them, saying, Take and drink of this, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you.
think of this as the body of Christ given for you. Thank you, Dan. I think this is the body of Christ given for you. Body of the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. I think this is the body of Christ that's given for you. Take and eat. Fred, the body of Christ which is given for you. Take and eat. Carry the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. And may it be the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ evermore strengthen and preserve you in faith until your life everlasting. We part in his peace and for his service. Amen.
May indeed the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ evermore strengthen and preserve you in faith until your life everlasting. Depart in his peace and for his servants. Amen. Amen. And the benediction is speaking well of God to you. May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen.